First of all, I would like to congratulate all the students that are there today at STEC because I know that if they're there, they did a great job in our space robotics competition and uh, that, that, is a, that is a fantastic feat that they, they should treasure and no, no matter what the results are today, these guys are winners. Uh, I myself have never been able to compete in something like that, so I'm really proud of you guys. Um, I would like to um, to tell you a little bit about my space flight. I uh, I think that every every space flyer, every astronaut thinks that his uh, mission is special and uh, better than the others. Uh, in my case, I think I'm right because uh, if uh, one thing that every astronaut's hope for is for his space mission to be to be unique and interesting. And in my case, I, I found that I believe that my space flight was incredible because. Uh, there are some activities that you can do in orbit and my increment we, we were lucky enough to have everything happen in in one in one single increment 36 37 we saw the arrival of, of ATV started right away with the arrival of ATV and then we had two EVAs uh, one of which became uh, very very famous because of, of a problem I had uh, while outside you know something that doesn't happen uh, very often and from which we are, we are learning a lot about space flight and our and our spacesuits. We had uh, two space two other space vehicles arriving. Uh, uh, we had HTV uh, number four Kunotori, and also the very first um, commercial vehicle um, Cygnus, which arrived only a couple of weeks ago, and which let me uh, uh, try flying the robotic arm Canon Arm Two for the first time for a European. So. Um, I was I was very happy to be able to experience that, and also the fact that I am uh, the flight engineer number one on the Soyuz. I am very I got to be very familiar with the systems, very um, very in depth with the procedure. So um, I think that from from a personal point of view, uh, it's been a fantastic experience. And then if we go beyond my personal experience, but to the general uh, success of the mission. It's uh, uh, apart from the things that I already told you, uh, what we do here in space is uh, is important. Is always important. We do we do exploration, we do science, we do technology, and all those three items have been touched by my expedition. Um, uh, one one example that I can give you is uh, Earth observation, which is a, a little talked about, but it's very important. We have a, a fantastic platform here on the station. Well. In my in my increment, uh, we have taken more pictures uh, of targets that were uh, that were sent up from the ground, uh, specific location that they wanted to take us pictures of. We have made, we have taken more of those than any other expedition before us. We're talking almost twice as many uh, targets acquired. So we are really proud of that and, uh, with, with my crew, of course, and. Um, I don't want to take any any more of your of your precious precious time, and I would like to to hear uh, the questions of the students on the ground. How long does the final approach of the ATV to the ISS take? Th that's an excellent question. So well, let's start with uh, showing you the ATV. So this is a model of the ATV, and the final approach starts when the ATV is behind the station, and then it slowly approaches uh, to the final docking until the actual uh, automatic docking. And it's a process; it doesn't last very long, you know. It will be uh, it will be parked a couple of kilometers, then it burns, and it gets closer to the station. And then when it's when it's about 19 meters away, uh, that's where we really. Where really things get serious and all in all it, it lasts uh, a few minutes uh, it moves at a, at a speed of about 15 centimeters per second so it's uh, it doesn't it doesn't take long for the for the spacecraft to uh, to dock however from launch until docking it, uh, it takes a couple of weeks that's because after launch the engineers take care of a series of tests that every spacecraft have to do and uh, they they do maneuvers to take the spacecraft from its parking orbit at 250 kilometers all the way to the station orbit at 400 kilometers. Hello, my name is Rianne and do you think that robots will take over humans jobs in um, space missions? Uh, that, that's a very good question. Um, I Personally, I don't think there is a competition 
for one to take over the other. I think that the, the future, which is already happening, is for humans and robots to work together uh, to, make the, to make the job and the, the result better. Uh, robots already help us a lot, you know. A rover or the robot, the robot manipulator, the Canadarm, those are all robots that help us uh, in in the space exploration. And I think the future is going to be like that. We're gonna we're gonna have more interactions between robots and humans uh, to to make an easier job. There are so there are many examples in which robots and men can cooperate in exploration. A robot can land in an area that's, that is that has never been uh, tracked and never been explored before and make sure that the conditions are are, are good enough for for man explorers to come and colonize a, a, a new planet or an asteroid and so on. So I think that the future is not for one to take over the other but it's more of, of uh, more integrated operations and cooperation. Hi, my name is Michael from Spain, and as you will probably know, um, a great deal of their experiments have to do with obtaining new materials in a microgravity environment. Do you think that in a near future, would it be possible to build special factories with new materials? For example, I am thinking about high temperatures, superconductors, and could, be, could they be produced in an industrial level, uh, that, that, that's a that's an excellent question, and it's uh, you know it touches a very important part. How can we be sure that uh, that uh, that what we what we're doing will be uh, will become more uh, a, a standard uh, way of living and a, and a standard way of producing? So my answer is definitely yes. I I do believe that uh, we will be able in the future. Uh, to to have uh, to have factories and industries uh, that produce such materials, uh, I always say one thing. I say that uh, the, the, what's in the physics and the universe already has in position of what what is impossible. So when we go when we go and, and we talk about what is possible, I, I like not to put uh, I don't like to put any limits on on the possible. And so my answer is definitely yes. I think it will be it will be possible in the future. Hi, I'm Alba uh, from Galicia, Spain. Can you imagine in the future uh, an astrobiological activity from the ISS with only one astronaut and one robot? Well, that is something that we are working on right now. You know, uh, Robonaut is uh, is built uh, to simulate the same volume, pretty much, of uh, of an astronaut inside a spacesuit inside an EMU. And the idea is that Robonaut will be one day is the prototype for robots that one day will be able to perform duties outside to help an astronaut. Uh, I don't know how close we are to that to that reality. I I believe that it could easily be a third crew member. Uh, I think that uh, for uh, for certain kind of interaction, I really like the idea of uh, of uh, two astronauts, two humans being outside and being able to to interact together. Uh, but the, the future holds always always holds many surprises and and reality always beats fantasy so uh, again i say why not it, it 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 could be possible you know in a situation where there are only three people on board and uh, two needs to stay inside in order for the third one to go outside and you have a robot acting as the second uh, eva uh, eva crew member uh, it, it's certainly something that is not that it, that it, it's not completely out of out of, of the possibility, and uh, who knows? It really depends on how far we go with robotics and, and our robot capabilities. Hello, I'm Johannes. I'm from Germany, and my question is: um, In some pictures on your blog, the ISS looks very messy, and is there a strict regime where things should be? So. Uh, <laughs> The, the ISS is it's not messy. <laughs> um, it's um, it, the, the ISS doesn't have a lot of space for storage. It's two different things, and um, we have a system on board. It's called IMS. It's, it's the uh, in inventory management system, and this computerized system has a list inside of everything, every single piece of equipment that's on board the space station, and it's constantly updated by, uh, from by us. And from people and by people on the ground, so uh, even though it looks like there's stuff everywhere, 
uh, there is a, there is a very uh, there is a, there is an order to it, you know, so that uh, there, is, there are things that are deployed because they need to be easily accessible. Uh, these computers that you see around me and uh, uh, other equipment that is that you see around me, it's it's there for a specific purpose. It's it's being used constantly, and so they're outside. And other elements that 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 you see in the pictures. They're out because they they're constantly used by uh, by the astronauts for uh, science for uh, everyday use. Uh, however, behind these panels, all, all over the station and in uh, in our pantries, we have a lot of materials that it's uh, it's it's cataloged and and uh, whenever we need to to find it, it's very very easy. You call it up on a computer. The computer gives you the exact location. It tells you the barcode, and we even have. Um, uh, barcode readers and our, um, radio frequency finders in order to help us do that. So uh, there is a there is a very good order in everything that you see, even though it looks messy. And the reason why I think one of the reasons why it looks messy is is that we can use all all the walls and it doesn't make a difference. You know, we can use the side walls, we can use the deck, we can use the overhead, and 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 put things there uh, for easy access. And so. To the human eye, that doesn't it doesn't look normal. It looks messy, but in reality, it's um, it's there for a specific reason. Hi, my name is Dominic, and I'm from Czech Republic. And my question is: uh, What were your feelings during EVA when you detected water in front of your eyes? Oh, that that is a, that is a very good question. What are the feelings when you when you feel you have an emergency situation? Um, it, it, it's hard to exactly uh, tell you the feelings because at that point you are. Uh, in my case, I was I was focused on on the actions to take. So a, lo a lot of things happen at the same time when the water when the water reached over my eyes and and uh, prevented me from seeing around myself. So uh, the the sun the sunset came and uh, the sun uh, and so everything went completely dark. Uh, we were from. You know, you go from from daytime to daylight to nightlight uh, uh, darkness in 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 a in couple of instants. So uh, I couldn't see where I was. The water came over my eyes. I couldn't hear anything. Uh, my my priority in that moment was uh, to go back to the airlock to uh, to make sure that I that I was safe, that I didn't lose contact with the station, so that I could uh, re I could get inside in the airlock and be repressurized and take the helmet off. So at that point, I wasn't really thinking about feelings, you know. Um, you concentrate all your efforts into the next task, which in the case was do not lose contact with the station and go back to the airlock. Find a way, find a way back to where you came from, uh, even even with your eyes closed, and even if nobody can talk to you or you cannot hear anything. So um, uh, a lot of people ask me, were you afraid? I'm certain that there was a, a uh, there was a component of fear, but uh, the the trick here is that through a lot of training, and in my case, I have 15 years of experience uh, as a as a test pa as a pilot and as a test pilot. Through that experience and through training, you can convert a fear into into a positive feeling of of uh, uh, capabilities. You know, you uh, you can concentrate more, you can see things more clearly, and so at that point, I, I was just trying to uh, concentrate all this energy into one task, which is go back to safety. Hello there, my name is Vitor Morante from Spain. Is the buoyancy training for space flight similar to real microgravity experience? Uh, another very good question. So we use, uh, we use uh, neutral buoyancy underwater uh, mostly for EVAs. And uh, I have to say that is the, the most accurate uh, simulation that I've ever experienced. It's, uh, the the spacesuit is the same and uh, um, the, moving around the station and getting familiar with the outside of the space station and being outside is very very accurate. There are there are certain differences, of course. You know, um, uh, that the, the the suit is neutral, but it behaves in a different way. In underwater, when you try to move, uh, the, the initial motion is is really hard to do, but then it's very easy to stop and to stabilize yourself. On the contrary, when you are in orbit. Moving is really easy, but staying still is extremely hard. So 
things like that you, you cannot really simulate. But everything else, the neutral buoyancy really, really uh, uh, helps help, help me feeling comfortable as soon as I went out. You know, I was in my suit, I came out of the airlock, and I felt right away that I was in an environment that I was familiar with. And that's thanks to the neutral buoyancy facility that we use for training. Hello, my name is Yannick from, from Switzerland, and my question is, does the muscle loss only affect the skelet muscles or also the inter internal organs? And is the entire metabolism also slowing down? So um, that is a, that's, a, that's a very important question. We are still studying it. And um, as a matter of fact, uh, we, have find, we have found out that um, when we... When we are on the space station, if we work out the way we are supposed to, uh, if we, thanks to the to the new countermeasure systems that we have on board the station, uh, namely A Red, Civis, and T2, so our our weightlifting machine, our running uh, treadmill, and our um, our bike, uh, we can actually improve our muscles. Most of the most of the crew members when they go back. They're actually stronger than when they came up because we work out every day. So the um, the, the loss of uh, muscle density is not is not really a concern anymore thanks to the countermeasures that we have been uh, been able to develop during the years. If you didn't do any of those, um, if you didn't do any 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 of those uh, activities, if you didn't do sport constantly, two hours, two and a half hours a day, then you certainly have a degeneration of all the muscular systems. And uh, when you think of internal organs, and you know, I'm thinking about the heart. Yes, of course, it would be affected too. But uh, we are actually, uh, we have, our our engineers and bio and biomedical engineers and doctors have been very good at creating countermeasures to prevent that from happening. Hi, my name is Kaylee. Um, I have recently read that you have that you're going to have a 3D printer on board the ISS. What items will the astronaut will will be printing? Well, that's that's a fantastic uh, question. Um, we we don't have the 3D printer on board yet, but we will get it. And uh, the limit of what we can create is only our our imagination. Um, I can show you example of things that we could create uh, using a 3D printer. For example. This is our toolbox where we keep all our tools uh, here in Columbus, and uh, this was uh, this was created using a 3D printer. So this is a very good example of something that could be uh, could be created using a 3D printer. I can I can put it anywhere. And uh, other things include uh, pipes, valves, uh, things that can be that are small enough but they can break, and you can then install them into different parts of the space station. And uh, again, uh, anything anything else that has that that uh, the, the the quality of the material can sustain uh, the, the the role for which that thing is being designed can be can be printed up here, and it would really help us uh, improve our capability to to be autonomous. You know. If something breaks and you have to set it up from the ground, it takes a long time, it takes planning, it takes preparation. If something, if something small breaks and you can fix it by just creating, printing a 3D item and installing it, then it would, it would really um, improve our capabilities and our chances to do future exploration further away from Earth. Luca, this is Melanie from Aztec again. We just got the word that our time is up with you today. We would like to thank you very much for taking your time to answer all the questions you could. We'll send you some pictures of these fantastic robots that all these students have put together. And thank you again for your time, and they'll get back to their competition. Thank you from all of us here at Aztec. This thank will conclude you. our event. If you'd like to say goodbye to our audience. Actually, I would like to, I, thank you. Actually, I, I want to thank you. Thank you so much for participating in this ISA competition. You guys are 
you guys are our th th these students they represent our future and i'm really proud of you you should be proud of yourself for what you have accomplished and i really hope that you enjoy your day at estec and who knows my, one day maybe we'll meet and uh, i can shake your hands and uh, and tell you how, how proud i am of you seriously thank you very much and goodbye <laughs>